The scripture reading today comes from Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 31. <clears throat> Beaten up and thrown in jail. One day on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic and with her fortune telling made a, t a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, these men are working for the most high God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days until Paul finally fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit to possess her out in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And it was gone just like that. When her owners saw that the lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up, and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into a court with the accusation, these men are disturbing the peace, dangerous Jewish agitators subverting our Roman law and order. By this time, the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob, had Paul and Silas' clothes ripped off and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under the heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that, threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without a warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open. All the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailers saw all the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that all of the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in. Figuring he was as good as dead anyway, when Paul stopped him, don't do that, we're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? They said, put your entire trust in Master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. Thanks be to God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. Darkest night, you were close like Oh! 
Amen. Amen. All my life, you have been faithful. Amen. Oh, y'all can do better than that. All my life, God has been faithful. Amen. Amen. We ought to talk about the goodness of God. I'm going to wake the guys up in the back again. And I want you to move to the congregational purpose. Can you put that slide up? Because we're going to read that as our second scripture today. You say it, you say it every Sunday, so I thought it was good that we talk about it a little bit. So we read this together. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, anointing me to preach good news to the poor, sending me to proclaim release to the captives, and receiving a sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord. I will tell you what is the most amazing thing is that sometimes, as they say, we get it twisted. We think the gospel is about, that's all right, that's my sidekick. I brought her in in case y'all don't amen, I know she ain't gonna stop. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate that. I brought her in so she can go ahead and continue. To say amen. Thank you very much. You know, go ahead. Don't let nobody keep you from praising the Lord. Amen. 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 We get it twisted sometimes. We think the gospel is about centering ourselves and just becoming a better life. And it is about those things. But the gospel of Luke and then the book of Acts tells that people experience the gospel in a different way. For the first or second century when the gospel was being preached, people saw the gospel as something that shook not only them, but the whole world. In fact, what I think happened and has happened is that we've reduced Christianity because we no longer have the faith that we can make a difference. Now, the way to get through this sermon is to actually look at me and don't, don't act like it ain't you I'm talking about. confidence that we can change the world is very hard to get. So therefore we let go our hopes and our dreams of making a difference and we simply put God in a box of just making a difference for us. Just getting through the day. As if somehow it is either or rather than both and. And so we begin to believe that the whole reason that we do this gospel thing is just to get ourselves right. And then we do something crazy like read the gospel. And Luke says, when Jesus said, I came to change the world, and not only the world, but the conditions in the world. See, Sometimes when we say I've come to change the world, people think of it spiritually. I, I've come to, to, to change people spiritually, to, to have the kingdom of God. That's why Luke said, no, let me get it very clear. I came to keep the safters free. I came to take the oppressed. I came because the conditions of life needs to change for people. It's funny how comfortable we can get with other people's humiliation. It's a funny, funny, funny thing that we can just decide because we can't do anything, we just will make folk invisible. Oh, you know the invisible people. You drive by them every day. They're the ones that are sitting at the red light with a sign, we need help. Well, they're the ones that are sitting under the under the uh, under the the, the 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 overpass and trying to live. And we drive by them. If you drive by them enough and enough and enough, what happens is you just don't notice. Don't get it twisted, you young people. At Redwood High, he come up here wearing a Redwood High T-shirt in Tam territory. I don't know how he does that, but. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay, got a football coach. Anyway, so I, even young people, 
It's easy to watch other people being bullied and being pushed and deciding I can't do anything about it, therefore they become invisible. But here's the good news of the gospel. The gospel doesn't allow us as people of faith to allow people to be invisible. The 16th chapter of the book of Acts we have this story, and by the way, I read the whole thing because they told me in seminary you got to read the whole story, but I really want you to actually think about this. Paul comes, and he's going to preach the gospel, and he comes to a place called Philippi, and Philippi doesn't have a synagogue, don't even have religious folk, in fact, so he has to go to the street down to the, down to the river to preach. And every time he goes down to the river to preach, there's this crazy woman yelling out who's a slave. And I would love to preach that Paul's compassion was so compassionate. But no, in every translation of this text, it says that Paul was annoyed by her. <laughs> wow, you should see your faces. You don't like it when a great gospel person is annoyed. But I tell you right now, there's a lot of folks who when they see the homeless or when they see folk who are in struggle or they see people who are in bully, bully, their quiet emotion is, I just, I'm annoyed. Because they remind you of the bigness of the problem and the smallness of who I am. I'm annoyed. Because they won't go away. In New York City, they try to wash your car windows even when it's not dirty. And here, they hold up signs to remind you that you are blessed. When you're trying to have a bad day and you look up and you see somebody who's got two or three children that they're trying to work, you, then you get annoyed. That, don't they have programs for that? <laughs> don't they have people to do things about that? And so the gospel, Luke writes the story of this woman who Paul hears every day, and she's not just a woman. In fact, they don't even give her her name. Because you know, if you recognize someone else's humanity, yours might get better. If you recognize somebody else's problem, you might get out of your own self and your own bad day. And realize as bad as you had it, folk had it worse. But because we don't want to do that, because I don't know about you, but when I'm having a bad day, at first I resisted, then finally I just give in, you know. I'm like, I want to have a bad day. Don't matter. I mean, people can't even talk to me. Like, please, why? I can't believe they're getting in my face. I'm having a bad day. Let me just get through. Tomorrow will be better. At some point, you just accept the bad day. And then someone comes to remind you as bad as your day is. Someone else may be having a worse day. And so it's a real problem that you become annoyed. And here's the even more interesting thing. They don't give her her name and they say she's in slavery. Ah, I, will, I hope I can make this plain. It is the tendency of people in America right now it is a tendency of people who are seeing people hurt to somehow think it's their fault. Yeah, I remember how you get through this is just look at me and don't think that you've ever had that thought. Yeah. It's a tendency in the high school when you see someone being bullied, someone who's different, someone who, who why they got to draw attention to themselves as if it is their fault. It's a tendency to believe when you see someone who has drug or alcohol problems and have been hurt and put in the, themselves in a position that hurt, it's their fault. And you begin to look at them and you don't even give them a name. Their condition becomes who they are. Notice in the text, you can read it home. I don't even care what translation you read it in. They don't give her a name. They give her her condition. That's why we try so hard not to call folk homeless. <laughs> you know why? Because that's not who they are. They're people that are unhoused. But their definition of who they are are not homeless. Oh, 
And we are particularly worried about that in, the, in this church because for centuries they told people who were black people, they only, and, and many of you even in, when, in your studies in school, they never said enslaved people, they said slaves. As if somehow that's all they were. That the condition becomes, because that's the way you put distance. And you don't accept that. Not because, now please hear me well, not because I'm a mean person, not because I'm a bad person, because I'm overwhelmed. And I can't figure out what to do. Because you see, every one of us want to have the answer to the problem. It is the human brain that says, I'm not going to try nothing if I can't do nothing. I'm going to say that again because y'all missed that. If I don't understand what the end going to be, why should I try? I'm overwhelmed because I don't have the solution. And since I don't have the solution, I won't do anything. So Paul, every day he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and this inconvenient slave whom he doesn't even give a name. Guess what? She's the only one that understood what he was saying. <laughs> She's the only one that said, listen to this man. <laughs> He's trying to tell you the gospel. He's trying, oh, you're not getting the message. What an inconvenient thing to believe that people are not only human, not only it's not their fault, but they may be brilliant, bright, and wonderful, just in bad conditions. But the reason you don't see that is because we cannot afford to see it. So Paul daily, every day, and she keeps on going. How many brilliant people are locked up in addiction? How many brilliant people are locked up in situations of abuse? How many brilliant people are locked up in terrible situations and we believe something's wrong with them or we treat them as if they are not smart and brilliant and wonderful and now you feel good about it because it's in the scripture and you're just acting like Paul. And I got good news for you. When you were a person of faith, I don't know how, as I, as I say at home, now y'all, the brilliant people are here, the folk at home, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I want you to lean in very closely and hear the good news. The good news is that faith gives you another response. Good news is that God doesn't wait for you to be brought into a decision to do something. God will literally say, if you love me, the ministry that I have will become the ministry that you have. In fact, one of the ways that we know spiritual maturity is when people get over themselves. Hello. When people don't just are concerned about themselves and what's going on in their life, but something bigger rises within them. And you don't even know how that happened. Because, you know, I'm a, I don't know how I started caring for folk. I, I don't know how I started doing more. I don't know how. Have you ever found yourself volunteering and going, how did I get myself into this? Because you met somebody. Not by accident. But the Bible says that as she goes cry out of annoyance because she kept coming on to him, he looks at her. And he says something to her. By the way, he could have said days ago. Y'all missed that, didn't you? The first time she came, he knew she was bound. The first time she came, he knew she was a slave. The first time she came, he knew she needed help, but he didn't help her. But the good news is even if you miss it the first time, the second time, the third time, even if you mess up, even if you've been nothing other than, I gotta, I gotta not cuss at this point, but even if you've been, you know what I'm saying, right? When you decide to do something different, you're still on time. Even if you don't and you didn't and you can think of all the things, don't get mad about what you didn't do. But when God makes it something that you do, just do it. Ah. Some of you started coming to church here and these stupid bags were sitting right here. 
And we started saying, you don't have to join a ministry. You don't have to understand nothing. And then we said something that really sometimes get people mad. We didn't even tell you to find new folk. <laughs> you already know who needs a bag for the unhoused. Take it. Now, I know that means that when you left that bag, you were like, good Lord. <laughs> I really don't have any excuse now. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to pass this person anyway. I'm going to see this person every day. And you may not have taken it the first time. You may not have taken it the second time. You may not have taken it the third time. But you did take it. And the great joy we have around here is that there are some folk who come every week, even during the week, to get bags now. And the reason they came is because they found out that they had the right to affect someone's life even before they understood the power of it. I know. I know. You want to know all of the statistical realities. You want to understand all the theory of homelessness. I know you want to make people tell you their story, but I will tell you right now, that's humiliating. All we need to know is that you can help, and you help. So he looks at her and he says, hey, spirit, get out of her. But now becomes the second reason that we really don't do anything. And this is the reason why churches don't do anything. Because in the end, not only when folk who are bound get free, they mess up the people who bound them. The system that held them. I'm going to get real clear now. In Marin, in Marin County, the reality of the unhoused is not just folk ain't got money. The reality is none of us got enough money. The reality is the housing is terrible and the system hosts and moves people. In fact, one of the realities that we know is that people in every place are one to two steps away from homelessness. In Marin City, it's half a step. You lose your apartment, and you're already paying an exorbitant rent. And then you reach out, and you can't even find another one. And before you know it, you either got to leave or you're homeless. Some folks who are sitting right now, who may even be listening to us right now, who are staying in bad relationships and abusive relationships, it's just because that's the only way they think they can make it. He may be a fool, she may be a fool, but at least together our income can make us live together. Unless we remember the historical reality. We have a sister in the congregation that reminds us that this is not new. The systems put us into that place. And so when Paul went and he said, be free, it says the people who owned her got mad. Ah, listen to me closely. If you think you can do good for someone and someone not get mad at you, then you don't understand what evil is all about. If you think you can just volunteer for something and then the folks look at you and go, why are you putting all that time in? <laughs> Then you don't understand. This is why I appreciate every volunteer, because I don't know what you did before you got here. I don't know who you're dealing with. I don't know the conditions that you went to, but you're here, and I'm grateful to you. And because I'm grateful to you, I understand and don't assume that everybody's celebrating you. That's right. Say amen. That's right. I don't believe that everybody's celebrating you. I don't believe that you are leaving a household who maybe even understand what you're doing. But I thank God that you're doing it. But in this case, it says the entire Roman folk got because this woman was making money. The system, the economic system was being held up by this slave. You see, there's only two ways in Philippi you go in slavery. The first way is during the time of peace. When you were in debt, you could, tell, you could actually sell your children to slavery. The second time is when you were defeated. 
Now, here's the thing that blew, that blew my mind. And you, you, uh, uh, this is blowing my mind. Not only do the people, she wasn't just a regular slave. She was a gifted slave. The most gifted people among us are the folk that people will try to control and will try to hurt and will try to diminish because they don't fit in. So she was a slave because she had a gift. And because she had a gift, they wanted to destroy her. And when God came and freed her, her gift didn't go away. It just started working for the kingdom of God rather than for herself. And all her owners got mad. And they went after that. Now, I understand that's why some churches don't want to be involved <laughs> with these kind of ministries. Because they're going to come after you. They're going to tell us that we're too political. They're going to say that's not the gospel. They're going to say, why are you messing with stuff? And you know what we're going to say? We're going to say, did you read Luke? <laughs> this is what God told us to do. This is who we are. We don't have this gospel that's trying to make you feel good. We're having this gospel that's going to disrupt stuff. Oh, we're going to be obnoxious. We're going to be problematic. We're going to be an issue with people's lives because that's what the gospel does. And if you want to see people hungry, well, then you don't want to come here. If you want to see people who, who don't get told how great they are, then you don't want to come here. But if you want to see somebody who will look at you and say, we don't care where you've been. We don't care what you're going through. We don't care how you're going through it. We just want you to know God loves you and you are free and we will declare freedom over you. As long as God lets us be free and we will tell the world, you are, you are not just good, you're the goodness of God. Did you hold on, hold on? Ooh, you know, he's a little pushy now. <laughs> I get it. You get there. But I gotta connect something because sometimes y'all don't realize how the service is connected. When you were singing the goodness of God, y'all were thinking about how good God was to you. You didn't realize. You're the goodness of God. You're the goodness of God. When you help somebody who thought they weren't able to be helped, you're the goodness of God. When you're giving out those bags on Monday, you're the goodness of God. When you're loving somebody who think they're unlovable, you're the goodness of God. Don't you understand? God was faithful to you so you can be faithful to somebody else. This is the kingdom of God. This is why we celebrate you. Because you are the goodness of God. Now, as they say in that good news, yeah. it's just God is good. I know somebody told you, huh, uh, but, but I didn't change policy, but, 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 but I don't understand homelessness. I, I, you know, drug, there are people still drug addicted. There are people still going into prison. You're like, yeah, we're working that out too. But trust me, even in the midst of where they are, they still need the goodness of God. I don't wait till I have an answer to start answering. Because if God's been good to me, I'm going to be good to someone else. Just say amen and amen.